Hi, this is Jeff Messer, creator of Sex Spies and Rock and Roll and the Robin Hood Legend of Sherwood comics. And you're listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today on this rapid fire interview with a very talented and creative person in the entertainment industry. Not only was he a radio host, but he's a comic creator as well as an all around amazing person in his own right. And I've heard of him on many other podcasts and shows in the past as well, too. We're joined by the ever talented. Jeff Messer, how are you doing today? I'm great, Kurt. Thanks so much for reading all of that uh, made-up <laughs> PR uh, biography that, that we gave you, making me sound so much better than I think I am. Well, you know, I try to give the credit where credit's due as much as I can, so it works out that way. I appreciate it. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and, of course, what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. Well, uh, I am a tragically middle-aged science fiction comic book nerd who was fortunate enough to grow up in the time of Star Wars, uh, the original Star Wars. Graduated high school the year that the Batman movie came out, so all of my geek dreams were coming true as I was entering the world. I I did work for a number of years in theater trying to be a playwright and an actor and and doing all of that sort of stuff. When I was in high school, I'd started writing novels, thinking I was going to be a a great spy novelist. Those things kind of got abandoned when I discovered that uh, playwriting is a hell of a lot easier than uh, spy novels because you only have to write dialogue in plays and you don't have to describe every tree and every bird and everything that's going on and so just for expedience sake I, I went into that it was sort of a writing pursuit traveled as an actor for a number of years tried to pick up the spy novel in, in the mid 90s and go back to it I, I had some ambitions of doing it uh, again in the early 2000s it just never really kind of took off caught myself in the pandemic deciding that I was going to pursue uh, comic books at, at long last 2018 I got asked to co-write a book about comic book creator Mike Gray. In 2019, it got nominated for an Eisner Award. And here I am in San Diego at the Comic-Con. Didn't win, but still was there. And I just thought, man, I'm, I'm approaching my 50s in a couple of years, and this door just opened up to me to work in comics. And Mike Grell had asked me to help him with some projects and doing crowdfunding and Kickstarters and stuff. And I thought, now, now now's the time. You know, It's like if I'm going to be infantile in my habits and my my interest, I might as well uh, go back and pursue a childhood dream. And and so comics became the thing. And then, of course, the minute that we started doing it, the pandemic happened. And instead of holding off and waiting on that to subside, I just really immersed myself in the idea of doing it. Adapted a a stage play I had co-written with a buddy of mine, Robert Akers, into a comic book that was a Robin Hood adaptation. We did that first uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I pulled out these old spy novels from my wayward youth, and I thought, you know, this would be interesting. You know, I could do it as a, instead of updating it, do it as a retro 80s thing, because the 80s sort of had become like the 50s were when I was a kid, this throwback era of uh, people really attaching to it. Like, oh, there was something really cool about the 50s. There was something really cool about the 80s that hasn't been replicated since. You know, nobody wants to bring back the 90s out loud or the early 2000s, but the 80s, there was just the music and fashion, the weirdness of the 80s. I decided, no, I'm just going to keep these stories right where they were. I'm going to keep them in the 80s and, and just do it as a period piece and have a lot more fun with it. I mean, spy stories these days are overly complicated with tech. Mm. You know, everything is satellite images and somebody talking in an earpiece, uh, you know, right around the corner, there's three guys, and whatever. And, you know, you think back to the 80s when it was more uh, footwork. It was more on the ground, espionage, femme fatales and secret agents and all that nonsense. And I thought, this is, this is kind of fun. I had found an artist uh, and I sent some pages to him and some character ideas. And, you know, hey, can you just tackle this? Let me see if it's worth trying. And he came back with character designs for the, the lead six characters in that story. And I saw it, his designs, I opened the email that had the images in them. And I was immediately like, yes, he got it. He'd see, he brought those visions perfectly to life. I don't know how he did it, but he gave me exactly what it was that was in my head. We were off to the races and it very quickly became an anthology book instead of just my silly stories because when I was knee deep in the pandemic, my son was graduating high school during the pandemic and you know we're trying to sort of sort out, hey, you know, your junior and your senior year just really got screwed and you're going to graduate and go to college in the midst of this weird chaos that's going on. 
what do you want to do? What is it that we should start focusing on? And and he's talked about wanting to go into like film and TV. And nice. I thought, well, that's just really bizarre. You've never really talked about that. Before. I mean, he loves movies and he's a real kind of nerd about things like I am. And I was like, yeah, you need to prove it to me. You know, what's sparking this? And he goes, well, I'm working on a screenplay. And I thought, well, where did this come from? This is just so bizarre. Having grown up with me, I think he was a little intimidated to share because I dragged him to theaters and to rehearsals and plays that I had written and he had been he had seen parts of this this experience that I had and I think it was a little intimidating but he sent it to me and I started reading his uh, screenplay and I was like oh my god this is the same absolute insane action adventure garbage I was writing when I was his age which was the stuff I was just revisiting that I was turning into a comic book and I thought like San Diego Comic-Con wait a minute, there's a door that just opened. I adapted the first scene of his screenplay into a comic book. I had an artist draw it and said, hey, we'll do that as a backup feature. Did a Kickstarter initially uh, for the first project and it really took off. Came up with the title Sex, Spies, and Rock and Roll, which I thought it's the uh, the Campbell's Soup Can FDA requirement sort of thing. It's like, what you know, what are the ingredients in this that are going to make people want to buy it? It was like, oh, rock and roll, 80s, spies, 80s. Oh, sex, spies, and rock and roll. It would sell itself. The artist came up with a great poster image cover for the first book and it just kind of made itself appealing like people would see it and go i really kind of want to know what this is i had people who were going i want that image on a t-shirt you make me a t-shirt with that picture on it the kickstarter was hugely successful so much so that we funded it and then had stretch goals and beyond the funding every time we hit like a, another couple of thousand dollars in the stretch goal mm -hmm. I would say, well, in the next stretch goal, we'll add a six-page backup story. And three days later, boom, they, they would hit it. I was like, oh, my gosh, I get it. All right, so then we, if we do more, I'll add another six-page backup story. And the book wound up being uh, 112 pages. Oh, jeez. With eight, eight stories in it. I knew I was onto something really good. I, I just, uh, I felt like, all right, I've, I've tapped into to something. You know, people find the same things appealing that I do. There's an audience for it. Here we are with Zoop producing the third volume campaign. And the book has, has done uh, two volumes. This is the third. Nice. But also the main feature, based on my spy stories, I decided to take it out of the anthology book after book two, and it's now its own solo title. Solo titles running alongside the anthology. And so the anthology is like this breeding ground for characters and stories that will spin off into their own own books. And I'm suddenly creating a, a universe. I do. I blame George Lucas. I blame Star Wars and, you know, how much uh, the Disney Plus shows and all of that stuff. It's like this big Star Wars universe where, oh, we're going to tell a story over here. Are we going to tell a story over here in this time and this time and this before this movie and after this movie? And that's what my anthology book has turned into based mainly in 1985. It has the opportunity to go before and afterwards to tell a wider story. And hopefully all the threads lead so that by the end, you, the readers can go back and read the whole thing and go, oh, it all ties together. All of these things tie together into one giant story spanning decades. Well, there's something to be said about continuity and a universe that you create as well, too. I mean, it's pretty amazing when you can follow the threads like that and see the final picture, whatever that may be. It's bizarre because, you know, my childhood, I grew up in a very kind of small rural type community, lived close to my cousin, and he and I really kind of let our imaginations sort of rule our lives. You know, <laughs> growing up in, in farm country, things can get a little boring. And so we would be very creative. And at the point that I come up with some of these ideas, and he was my sounding board, really, and we would uh, bounce this back and forth. You know, we came up with a board game one summer based around these characters. Got a big piece of white construction board paper and drew the, the game board and made the pieces. And, and it was playable. We played that game for a year, you know, like we came up with the rules. How does it work? What are the this, that, and the other? And it was all based around these these silly stories that I was making up and kind of going to him, hey, what do you think of this? And then he would give me his input. And I was like, all right, well, then we'll do this. And then we'll do that. And it just sort of grew out of that. You know? So are we going to see that as a stretch goal? Yeah, well, you know, it's funny. He and I, because he's going to write a story for the next volume uh, of the book. He and I, I kind of talked about it. I was like, you know, we could maybe not necessarily a board game, but like a, a card-based game or something mm -hmm. like that. And so we, we could come up with a game eventually out of this so it has been talked about and he and i have talked about another great 80s thing is doing uh choose your own adventure style oh, yeah. books with these characters as part of this growing universe that, that we're doing you know it's wonderful because he's kind of come back on board you know my son is involved a friend of mine from high school who is a writer and was a writer at the time and i really I thought I was a writer and he was so much better than I was when I met him in high school. And so I was envious, but I also looked up to him and I showed him some of this stuff when I was writing it originally and he's on board. 
Nice. Yeah, there's a story in the second volume that he wrote. When I started putting it out there, he reached out to me on social media. He saw that I put it up and he was like, wait a minute, are these those characters? <laughs> and then that story that you, you're bringing that back? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to give it a try. And it has turned into this enormously fun thing. Just kind of thrilled, brought back relationships with people that I've not been in great touch with over the years as time goes on and things happen. I don't know. It's really bizarre. That okay. something from when I was 15, 16 years old is now dominating my creative life. It's, it's fun to get passion reignited, especially in this type of story that you're, you're finally revisiting after all this time. And, and I can hear it in your voice. I can hear the excitement and energy that you have about not only the friendships you've rekindled, but of course the comics itself. It's so, young. It's making me young. It's like the fountain <laughs> of youth when I'm 15 again. That's the one of our most crazy ages, I, I think, because we survived a lot in the 80s and, and 90s. We don't know how, but we survived. <laughs> No, that's the yeah, boy, it's a different time. When a radio station locally every Sunday morning replays the entire Casey Kasem's Top oh. 40, whatever year in the 1980s that correlates with that weekend. <laughs> and so like this past weekend was like, you know, the weekend ending January 31st, 1981, you know, and it's all, you know, Hall and & Oates and Eddie Rabbit, oh. I Love a Rainy Night. And it's like, what? It takes you back there. And I'm like, we lived in a barbaric age. You know, it's like you listen to the radio, there was no cell phones, yeah. there was no, video games were still relatively new and they were all Atari 2600. <laughs> you know, they were all garbage by comparison. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Compared to what I grew up with, we're, we're living in Star Trek. I mean, yeah. today is like this wild science fiction future compared to what it was back then. It's kind of fun to revisit that and sort of rekindle it. I love going down the rabbit hole of research and, and history. And I have a whole calendar of 1985 that I printed out so that I can write what's happening fictionally in the stories and figure out where things fall on certain days. And and I want it to be accurate, you know, even down to the point of the songs that are referenced in the stories, songs that if somebody was like, you looked it up and you go, oh, son of a gun, you know, uh, Some Like It Hot by Power Station was number 30 in the top 40 when this story happened, mind blown or whatever. So I take the time to make sure that if I put something in there, it's, it's researchably accurate. What is the most misunderstood aspect about the spy genre and the 80s for that matter that people of today don't quite understand? Oh, wow. Uh, that's a tough, uh, interesting question. The 80s and the spy genre, I think it's sort of underrated. Everybody thinks of uh, James Bond, you know, when they think of spy movies, and then they tend to think of, of Sean Connery in the 60s and Roger Moore in the 70s. And, and by the 80s, things were changing so drastically. And I, I think as we were leading up to the end of the Cold War, the way that the world was going, the, the types of things that were happening. And I, I remember this in some of my research and in retrospect you kind of look back on it and go oh we're connecting the dots that as the cold war was ending the age of terrorism was rising because airplane hijackings were huge uh, libyan hijackers and things like that in the mid 80s especially two three times a year they were hijacking airplanes and then having them land in these hot spots in the middle east and you know we were so kind of preoccupied with russia and then when gorbachev comes in and there's a, a sense of nah, he wants to help kind of bring this to an end it's not economically sustainable the this, this Cold War stance, that sort of terrorist thing waiting in the wings that you know, retroactively you look back on, and Iran-Contra thing with South America, Central America, and all this stuff going on. There was a real smorgasbord of things that the spy community were heavily involved with, and not all of it related to the thing that people think about when they think of that age. A good example. One of my favorite James Bond movies is The Living Daylights, right. the first Timothy Dalton movie. And the reason I say this is because it's not just a James Bond movie. It's a perfect 80s spy movie. And you could show it to someone who's never seen a James Bond movie and would never see one since, and it doesn't matter about what came before or came after. It works on its own. It works as a Bond movie. It works as a 1987 Cold War spy movie. And it has all of those elements. It has the, the Mujahideen in Afghanistan, the, the Afghani rebels that we were supporting who eventually became the terrorist that bin Laden brought that he was a part of. It contained the gun trade aspect of it. It contained the Russian intrigue and the Cold War behind the Iron Card. It had everything. And I think if you want to see what gets me going as far as spy movies, it's all in The Living Daylight. You watch that movie and it's like, this hits all the sweet spots for me as far as that era goes. And I think people just sort of forget that we were at this crossroads. The 80s was a crossroads leading from one type of sort of international espionage to another. By the 1990s, the early 1990s with the war in Kuwait, that was the first time we saw the infrared 
infrared video sequences on CNN, you know, the, the airplane dropping the bomb and you watching it go down the chimney of the house and blow it up in real time. That was the point that that started changing. But before that, it was all very kind of remote and clandestine. I didn't have that. I don't know if that answers the question, but it was uh, it was a rabbit trail that I just drug us down. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? I grew up in a rural kind of farming community. And as a kid, my grandparents babysat me. My grandmother in particular babysat me quite a bit. As was the custom in the 70s, the television was the, uh, the extra help with babysitting. I apparently watched uh, an unnaturally unhealthy amount of morning game shows, you know. The Price is Right and the, all you know, all that stuff in the morning game show and would mimic the MCs and would mimic, you know, certain things that I would see on TV. And I, I was really, you know, beyond game shows, I was in the TV in general and w- would imitate and mimic things that I saw and heard. As a kid, I had a neutral dialect, a sort of accent, unlike everyone else in my family. <laughs> it was this weird, like, not that they would make fun of me necessarily. They were all very Southern and imagine that sort of dialect. And I should have been just like that because, you know, n- nature versus nurture kind of argument. I was the environment that I was in. I was immediately kind of interested in other things, the way other people talk, the stories other people told, different experiences that were outside of the realm of this sort of limited world that I lived in. To me, I think that was it. That was compelling to me. And language as a, as a powerful sort of tool was understanding the difference between between people's experience. And then once you know the difference, you see similarities. You see what makes us fit together and what we more or less have in common, despite our differences. And I don't know that I knew how to apply it until many years, many years later. Sounds like you applied it well in your radio career as well. Well, it was it was a lot of fun. Working in theater helped me in radio immensely. It was like improv for three hours a day doing a live radio talk show. It's like a tightrope without a net underneath it. You turn on the light and you start talking and people start calling and they have questions or they have comments and you just sort of discuss what's going on in the world or anything that would come up. And then things would happen in the middle of the show. I was on on air the day the Boston Marathon bombing happened. Had to, within an hour of being on the air, had to stop talking about whatever we were talking about and kind of go to this live coverage mode. You know, we had a TV in the studio, so I was able to see what was happening, trying to, you know, going online. And I knew people in Boston and trying to email or message them. And it's like, hey, you know, what's your, are you anywhere near what's going on? Can you give me some perspective? Call, can you call my show? It certainly, it certainly helped, I think, at, at, at certain points in the radio career. And you have a, a Zoop campaign currently, is that right? Well, we're about a week in, a week and a day or two into the campaign, and it's 64% funded at this point. So far, so good. It's It's got that little middle of the campaign lull going on. But So what does Zoop offer that maybe other crowdfunding services? You know, I, I used Kickstarter uh, predominantly. I mean, Kickstarter is kind of synonymous with crowdfunding. Man, a lot of people use it. It's a very full, very exciting platform. I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of campaigns. I back a lot of campaigns, you know, because you put your money where your mouth is kind of the way I look at it. I I need to support things if I want people to support me. Uh, But there's just so much of it there. The thing that Zoop offers and the reason that I went with with Zoop is that they handle a lot of the logistics. They, They do a lot of publicity. They do a lot of printing logistics, the shipping logistics and things like that. And Kickstarter, you're kind of, Unless you have that in place or you're paying another company to do those things for you, you're kind of a a one-man band on Kickstarter. And I'm lousy (laughs) at packing and shipping and doing all that because I want to work on the next project. So Zoop, uh, the wonderful part about what they do is they basically say, we'll take care of all that nonsense. You just keep creating. You keep working on content. And when, when you're ready to go with the project, we'll launch it. It takes a lot of that worry and a lot of that extra sort of non-creative logistical stuff off of my plate. And I think that's fantastic. I I suck at it. I'm terrible at that stuff. You know, looking at your career as a creative person, no matter the industry that you've been in here, what are three things that you've accomplished that you are proud of? And what are three things in the future that you are looking forward to accomplishing? Three things that um, that I've accomplished that I'm proud of. The first time when I was starting out in my early 20s working in theater, I got invited to tour as a performer with a touring company for a couple of years before I went to college. So I took time off to actually work as an actor. I was just thinking about this today, in fact. At the end of this two-year cycle that I was with this company, we went to Edinburgh uh, for the, the Edinburgh Fringe Festival and performed 
for three weeks and spent two more weeks, you know, as tourists in Edinburgh and London. Man, what a special time that was. And to to be a professional at, at age 21, whatever it was, be touring and going around the world was just really, really kind of a cool moment. And it, it helped me to grow up and sort of be more adjusted than your typical college student who's like, I'm going to go to Hollywood and I'm going to become famous. And it's like, I've already been out there working and let me tell you, it's not, not what you think it is. So it made me a little more pragmatic. It was definitely one. The working for iHeartRadio came as a surprise. Knew the host of a local talk show that was uh, leaving the show that he created. And I reached out to him and said, man, I hope that somebody comes along and keeps this going because what you were providing for, for the community and what you were providing was really important, I think. And his response was, why don't you come in and take a meeting with him? Because I think you should do it. And it was like out of nowhere. I was like, you know, why not? So I went in and met. Three weeks later, I was on the air with a show that lasted five years. And it changed my self-confidence. It changed my imposter syndrome. Uh, I was able to kind of keep a, a lid on that for a number of years because, you know, you just have to take on this, this persona of, you know, you become a voice for the community you're speaking to, to a large extent. There's a weight on your shoulders that goes with that. There's a responsibility that goes with that. And, and you become a very public figure during that time. And it was a political talk radio, progressive political talk radio, if anybody cares <laughs> what my viewpoints are. And I'm in Asheville, North Carolina, so it's a very progressive town. So I got invited to a lot of stuff. It made me sort of feel like, oh, I'm, I'm respected now. And, I'm, and, and honestly, the comic book stuff wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for that experience, because coming out of radio and, and going into publishing, I finally had enough nerve to believe in myself, pursue those things, because five years of being that, whether I was really confident or not, but pretending to be confident, kind of paid off. Started working with Mike Grell and then got asked to co-write this book. And, and so the third thing that, that I'm most proud of was the Eisner Award. The first thing I do in the comic industry gets recognized by one of the most prestigious uh, awards there is. I didn't win, but I, I don't. I didn't care about whether I won or not because it, it was just to me as a kid growing up, you know, in the small community that I grew up in, loving comics and reading comics, and then being, uh, you know, a VIP at San Diego Comic Con. You know, there's there's no two ways around it, and then it's like life change. And very proud of that moment. And, then, you know, as far as the things for the future, I want to go back. As I was leaving San Diego, walking away as they were closing the convention on that Sunday, the first feeling that hit me was, I've got to come, I've got to get back here. I, I need to come back. And so working toward that goal of coming back, and I, and I want to, you know, continue working with, uh, with Mike on projects that he's doing. He and I are working on a lot of really cool stuff, and it's just sort of living that dream and by example, kind of showing my kids, even though you're growing up, you don't really have to grow up, you know, leaving yourself and kind of keep pursuing that stuff. That's really all I want out of the future is just to be able to just keep doing this. I don't care uh, if it be, is any more successful than it is now, as long as it can keep going. Even if it's limping along, as long as I can keep telling these stories and doing it, I'll be satisfied. Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS post piece of advice that you've received in your career? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received in your career that just stuck with you? An old theater director, professor of mine from college, once joked backstage before a show talking to, to us as actors, he kind of giving us a piece of advice and he goes, listen, the, the, the one thing you never want a director to say to you before opening night of a show is stay low and keep moving. It was a funny joke at the time. He passed away about a year ago, uh, you know, rest in peace. That stuck with me for years and years because I thought that applies with so many things in life. You can't get through life sometimes without just stay low and keep moving, man. Just get through it. And perseverance goes a long way. Uh, Everyone right. has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? I thought about recently, like if I ever wrote a memoir, what kind of funny title uh, would I would I come up with for it? You know, I was thinking of my 80s pop culture and growing up, the period that I grew up in. One of the titles I had for the book was something like uh, Alan Alda, George Lucas and Huey Lewis made me who I am today, uh, which is like hitting touch points of a huge Alan Alda MASH fan when I was a kid. George Lucas kind of changed the, my, my world. And my favorite rock band when I was a kid was Huey Lewis and the News. <laughs> that title doesn't work because it doesn't include comics in some way. And the very first comic book that my grandfather brought home 
from the little corner store, randomly, I might add, when I was a kid, ended up being a comic book that was uh, drawn by Mike Grell. Mike Grell and I, you know, I was a fan of his for decades. And for the past 10 years, we've been friends, uh, friends enough that uh, that he's asked me to work on projects with him and to help him bring some of his characters, his creator own stuff back to, to print and back to life. And honestly, where I am right now, as far as the comics and stuff goes, I think is because of what I saw in that first comic that he drew, written by Jim Shooter, who was another inspiration because he started when he was a kid writing comics. Yeah, it, it would have to be Mike, I think, at this point, because of what I'm doing. From a professional standpoint, you have created, of course, amazing series with Legend of Sherwood, which we didn't get to talk, touch on today, but that's okay. We'll have to get you back on to touch on that in the future. Of course, your Sex, Spies, and Rock and Roll uh, is is doing extremely well with your campaign, so congratulations on that. And I look forward to what you have in the future with that series. So professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, no, no. I mean, no, yeah. I, there's this weird, weird thing. I mean, I think I, I'm a I'm a Generation X person. I don't know. I I have a hard time with it. I, I kind of jokingly say that you know, my imposter syndrome gets the best of me more often than not, uh, because I I look at situations that I get myself into, whether it be at, at San Diego or whether it be performing or when I was on radio and people were treating me like I was some sort of important person. I have a hard time with that. But you have to have a certain amount of ego, self-confidence to do any of these things. I mean, it's a ballsy thing to go, I'm going to write a comic book and get people to draw it and other people are going to like it. Why should I be that way when somebody else isn't? Or, you know, why do I deserve that when someone else maybe doesn't. So you have to have a little bit of that. I used to joke, I think this was back when I was in college and I would joke with probably with girls I was trying to date, I would say. Uh, and I would say, you know, listen, I, I'm the most modest egomaniac you'll ever meet. And that's one of those things that I've kind of kept in my my quiver over the years to kind of kind of reel out there. Because yeah, there you got to have a certain swagger and a certain ego to do this, to believe you can do it. But at the same time, you've got to stay grounded, and you you know you don't want everybody to go, yeah, you know, the stuff he writes is really good, but man, he's a jerk. You know, you you want to you want to kind of walk that that fine line. I think stay humble, basically. Try and yourself. stay humble. When I was writing short stories in college, I had a professor uh, who used to say every time I'd write something, turn it in. Uh, anytime it was a first person story, he would be like, you're like, like a, you've got this Woody Allen thing going on where it's like the self deprecating, you know, yeah. sense of humor. It's like you'll make fun of yourself before anyone else can get to it. And I'm like, oh, how did he figure that out? And so I think there's a lot of that, too. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? I, you know, creative people, you've got to be uh, like a shark, I think, and just keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. Or it goes back to that uh, that theater advice, stay low and, and keep moving. You know, it depends. You have to define failure mm -hmm. in different ways. For a long time, and especially now that I'm doing this in my, my 50s, uh, working on comics, I think back to 30 years ago when I wished I could work on comics and I, oh, I wanted it so bad. The maturity of 30 years is that I know now that if I had gotten these stories into comic book form 30 years ago, it would have been a failure. Mm. It wasn't going to happen until now, and it wasn't supposed to happen until now. It's a, a little cosmic, a little fatalistic, I suppose. But it's that everything happens for a reason, even a perceived failure. I always look at that as kind of being nudged in a different direction and I have to pivot and find something else creative to do. I used to do a lot of theater and I used to be involved in theater and I haven't been in, in a long time, but someday I'll go back and do it again. If the comic book thing kind of runs out of steam, then you know I'll pivot, I'll go and, and do some theater, I'll, go, I'll write a play or something. The idea is to never quit, to never sort of give up on yourself, that one failure is just another opportunity. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a writer, playwright, or comic creator of some way, shape, or form, as your son followed in your steps. They're looking at you as an inspirational person. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I hope that the, the thing, you know, in my myriad of other things too, I did work with youth theater programs for a number of years as, as a sort of teacher as well. And I, and I always used to give 
this piece of advice to some of the older kids who, you know, if they were graduating high school and sort of moving on, the thing that I would tell them is you're going to be tempted to give up on on what you love to do, whether it's music or theater or or whatever, you know, writing, if you want to be a poet, if you want to be a musician, an actor, whatever you want to do, there will come a time when someone will confront you with the, hey, you need to pay the bills and you need to quit that in order to be a responsible adult. And I said, don't, don't accept that when, when people give that to you. You can and you should if you have a thing that you love to do. If you want to be a musician, for example, and you're going to pay your dues by playing in coffee houses and bars and, and whatever, well, then, you know, you can still pay your bills, but you can't take a type of job that requires you to work on Friday nights because that's when you're going to want to be doing your thing. Always find a way to survive but to keep what makes you happy alive, the thing, the creative energy inside of you, the thing that makes you happy, never compromise that. You can find plenty of other things to do to fill in the cracks, but never give up that thing that you love to do. And so if it's creative and it's writing and it's like, you know, put fame out of your mind and just do it and stick to it. Like I said, facilitate keeping that as a part of your life, I think is one of the most important things. And so I don't know if any of them ever took that advice, but I gave it uh, for, for several years. So, If your life was a comic book or a film or series, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? Which is why I said it sounded like what you just said. <laughs> the An alternate title. So, so <laughs> this, and I have one, believe it or not, I already have an alternate title. Uh, plan, and uh, it, it's something like, um, "I'm not famous, but you might know me." I love that, and and to me, that's that's what I aspire to be. Is you know, maybe I'm not famous, but people go, "I think I've heard of this guy," I, and, and you know, and to have a good reputation as a result would be nice. So, uh, "I'm not famous, but you might might know me" was uh, going to be one of my memoir titles. I might write too. Who knows? Or, you know, maybe the movie people will go, we have to change it for the film. It's going to be called The Most Famous Person You've Never Met because they have to change things. Soundtrack. Yeah, I mean, it would be, it, I'm pretty eclectic in, in my musical taste. Uh, it would be a nice uh, cross-section of Huey Lewis and the News, Phil Collins and Genesis, oh, yeah. sprinkling of uh, Dave Matthews Band, the Gin Blossoms, Cheryl Crow, there's a band uh, called Train that I, I'm uh, liked for a number of years. Uh, I, I try not to just stay in one decade, but I, it's been tough the past ten years or so because music has gotten a lot of sameness to it. But yeah, I mean, it's it's pretty it's a pretty broad span of, of things that I I like. I don't know. I could probably come up with a top ten songs. Whether it's like you know, a hip to be square certainly uh, comes out as a oh, yeah. a song that. Uh, as soon as I heard it in 1986, I was like, I, I feel like I identify with something in this this song. Uh, even though when, once I found out what it was really about, it has nothing to do with that. But it's like, <laughs> nah, I kind of attached to it that way. So, so Hip to be Square might be a, a good title. But I, I think Huey Lewis's autobiography will probably have that on it. Well, Jeff, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Kurt, it was so much fun. I really, really appreciate it. Oh. For those that want to support you and, of course, support the campaign, where can we find you online and on social media? Uh, I'm I'm kind of uh, ubiquitous on social media. You can find me just uh, Jeff Messer, uh, easy enough to find. My Sex, Spies, and Rock and Roll has a Facebook page. So does the Robin Hood uh, Comic Book Adventures has a Facebook page, as well as Instagram. I'm on, on Twitter and uh, Zoop. Dot .gg is the website for Zoop's great, great campaign site. Uh, they're more of a boutique than Kickstarter is. They only do a few campaigns at a time. I'm super lucky that Sex, Spies, and Rock and Roll is one of them right now. So if you go to Zoop.gg, you can find it right there. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others, quite literally, since 2008 on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word, two, not the number two. Of course, on our YouTube channel, which is definitely a lot more updated than our website, because I'm only one person. I don't have a staff. Sorry. Which is youtube.com forward slash C forward slash TGT Media. And the podcast is finally back after 15 years, which is twogeekstalking.podbean.com. You can find it on all of your streaming services, except iTunes, because I'm still working. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. 
Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.